The unthinkable horror of a wild animal attack unfolding on a family member right in front of your eyes is unbearable to imagine. The helplessness of not being able to protect your loved ones, the screams, the chaos, and the sheer brutality of such an event etch themselves into the memory of those who witness it, leaving scars that may never fully heal. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we go over three times an animal fatally attacks someone in front of their loved ones. Welcome to Final Affliction. Polar bears are known to be one of the most fearsome predators in the natural world. You've all heard the advice when coming across a bear. If it's brown, lay down. If it's black, fight back. If it's white, good night. Luckily, polar bear attacks are very rare, and there have only been a few recorded fatalities. Despite this, the number of bear attacks worldwide have gradually been increasing over the last couple decades. Increased food scarcity and habitat destruction is forcing these animals to leave their natural environment and encroach onto human territory in search of food. What little habitat these animals have left is often used for hunting and hiking by humans, leaving them with very few places to go as the likelihood of encountering someone increases. While brown bears have always been the main perpetrators of these bear attacks in North America, there is an alarming trend growing as polar bear attacks are on the rise. Aaron Gibbons was 31 years old in 2018 and was considered to be an incredibly experienced and talented hunter. He was a family man, someone who held his three children above all else and kept them safe no matter what. He lived in Arviat Nunavut, an area known to be very remote, suffering incredibly cold temperatures throughout the winter. This meant the community must help each other out if they were to survive the season. Aaron regularly used his hunting skills for the good of his community, selflessly providing meat for those in need. Aside from the cold, the area shared its land with an apex predator, the polar bear. Despite the close proximity, there had not been an attack in the area for 18 years, and the indigenous people knew to leave the animals alone creating an understanding between the bears and the people of mutual respect and solitude. Naturally, there had still been encounters with the bears, so a patrol had been set up on the outskirts of town to protect the inhabitants. Their job was to redirect any bears who got too close to the settlement. Aside from a few interactions, there was relative harmony between the people and the bears. On July 3rd, Aaron decided to visit Sentry Island with his children to take them fishing and spend some quality time together. The island was around 10 miles away from their home by boat and was a regular fishing spot for locals and tourists alike, particularly as it was a hot spot for beluga whales. The family planned on gathering some bird eggs on the island, and as soon as they landed on shore, the children ran off the boat, excited to spend time with their dad for the day. He briefed them on the do's and don'ts of their activities to make sure they would be as safe as possible, but he didn't foresee any issues for the day. After explaining some of the dangers, the children headed off to collect their eggs. Aaron was proud to see how excited they were and was ready to slowly teach them everything he knew so that they could grow up protected by his knowledge. While watching the children, he spotted something in the distance, and the longer he stared at it, the colder his blood turned. A polar bear was slowly stalking his youngest daughter, creeping closer and closer to where she was searching. The bear's ears were facing backwards, signaling to Aaron that the bear considered his daughter to be prey, and he knew that there was no way that she would win the fight against the bear. At this time, she was completely unaware assessing a nearby bird's nest to see which eggs she should take back to her dad. Aaron shouted to his children, telling them to run to the boat as fast as they could. He sprinted towards them, trying to get between the bear and the children, but as he ran, he realized he had left his rifle on the boat. He was running towards a polar bear on the hunt with no protection but his bare hands. With no time to go back for his rifle, he began hurling rocks at the animal in an attempt to distract or scare it away from his children. Aaron was desperate and knew he would do anything he could to save his children. 
Thankfully, a few of his rocks hit the animal and confused it, stopping the predator in its tracks momentarily. He was so thankful that his children were no longer in the animal's pursuit that it took him a second to realize that all of the bear's attention was now fixed on him instead, and he was completely unarmed. He shouted to his eldest daughter on the boat, telling her to call for help on the radio while he continued to throw rocks at the bear, hoping to scare it off. Aaron quickly realized that the rocks weren't scaring the bear away as it continued to approach him. Terrified and running out of options, he decided to break all the rules. He turned his back on the animal and ran for the boat. He could hear the bear behind him and knew that it was much faster than him. He just needed to get close enough to the boat so his daughter could throw him the rifle. It was his only chance. He ran along the shore, praying that he would be able to make it back to his children in time. Unfortunately, polar bears run more than 30 miles per hour. It was impossible for him to outrun the bear. He looked at his children one last time as he was pulled to the ground while the bear leapt onto him from behind. The animal grabbed him by the neck and began throwing him from side to side, the strength of the bear making Aaron seem like a rag doll in its grip. The pain must have been excruciating as his body was thrown into the rocks and ice beneath him while his children were forced to watch. When Aaron finally stopped moving, the bear climbed on top of him and began to eat him, ending the life of Aaron Gibbons. The children were traumatized and begged for someone to come and help them over the radio. They hid in the boat, listening to the sounds of their father being devoured by the predator. Their prayers were soon answered as an emergency team arrived and took the children away before shooting and killing the polar bear. Aaron's body was half-eaten at this point and was taken back to his family in Arviat. Everyone was devastated by the loss. He was an important part of the community and well-liked by all. His sacrifice was not in vain as he saved his three children despite losing his life. Two years later, his bravery was recognized in a Canadian ceremony by the Governor-General and Commander-in-Chief of Canada, Julie Payette. He received the Star of Courage for the defense of his children, and, although he was not alive to receive it, his family were able to keep it as a physical reminder of the courage of Aaron, who was truly a hero to his family before meeting his final affliction. The Zhao family had been looking forward to this all week. Bao and Mei were married for over five years, and a little over a year ago, they welcomed their daughter into the world. Jia was the apple of her parents' eye, and the little girl shared the attention from her parents with her maternal grandparents. Mei's parents lived close by, and since her husband and father was often busy with work, Mei's mother, An, spent weekends with the couple. An and her granddaughter were inseparable, and Mei did not mind that her mother split her time equally between her own home and the Zhao family's apartment. She was such a great help with the little Jia, and went above and beyond to make the family's lives as easy as possible with cooking and keeping up with the housework while the young parents worked. So when they booked a family trip to the Beijing Zoo, Mei just automatically bought a ticket for her mother too. The grandmother was thrilled at the invitation. She'd never been to the iconic site either. The Beijing Zoo is one of the biggest in the world, housing an incredibly wide range of animals. Pandas, lions, elephants, wild African bucks, lizards, and the fan favorite, Monkey Hill, where there are over 100 rhesus monkeys swinging from the trees. You name it, the Beijing Zoo has it and they offer a unique experience where visitors can drive their cars through the many acres of land that hold these animals. The zoo does not believe in penning their animals in small and inhumane cages. Instead, they allow them as much freedom as they possibly can so that they can live their lives out as naturally as possible. The experience is as close to a real safari as you can get outside of Africa. So that morning, the Zhaos loaded their car full of snacks and drinks. However, Mei was slow to start. She'd woken up feeling a little nauseous, but she wasn't going to miss out on such an amazing family outing. And rescheduling the whole weekend would cost a lot of unnecessary money that the working family couldn't afford to waste. 
So May stayed at the back with her daughter for the first leg of the ride. After two hours, Bao parked the car in front of the ticket gates. He'd had a late night at work the night before, so May offered to drive them through the first half of the park while he kept her company in the passenger seat, with An taking over her place next to Jia, who was strapped safely into her car seat. May was feeling a little better than she did that morning, and she was sure she'd be fine to take over for most of the ride. Starting at the north entrance, they drove south, stopping first to see the reptile exhibit. Up next were the African animals. Lions, giraffes, and rhinos were all present. Just as their third hour in the park came to an end, they saw the tropical birds and the northern bears. That's around the time that little Gia nodded off. The toddler was long past her nap time, and she was most likely going to be out like a light for the rest of the ride. All in all, the morning had been an enjoyable one, but by noon, May was starting to feel ill again. The heat of the afternoon sun beat down on her, and she went from feeling slightly queasy to feeling downright faint with nausea. Just as they turned into the south wing of the park, entering the tiger enclosure, An noticed her daughter's pale complexion and encouraged her to switch places with Bao. They were past the halfway point by now, just where May agreed she would ride to. And even May had to admit that it was time to swap places with her husband before the dashboard became painted with the contents of her stomach. None of the occupants of the car had anything else on their minds other than making the change in drivers. It genuinely did not occur to them that they were in any danger at all. Up until this point, all of the animals had been behind sturdy fences or in cages. But in reality, the Tiger Exhibit and Monkey Hill were the two most popular attractions for a very specific reason. You could drive your car right into the wild animals' enclosures, with only the walls of your metallic vehicle around you for protection. All of the animals were fed on a strict schedule, so they were never hungry enough to pose a serious threat, and armored vehicles were parked with armed personnel inside every few meters or so as an extra precaution. None of the three adults in the car had even seen any stirrings of life in the exhibit just yet. They had driven only a few feet into it before Mel put the car into park. She released her safety belt, opened the door, and got out. Even the two Siberian tigers that were hidden in the trees were taken by surprise. Never in their entire lives of captivity had a human walked so freely amongst them. It was always just cars that drove past, and the zookeepers that threw their meat shares out of those big armored vehicles twice a day, where these animals ever saw any humans at all. Even though they were bred and raised in captivity and never once hunted a day in their lives, the moment they laid eyes on the walking, living creatures stepping out of the car, their primal instincts kicked in, and May was locked into the sights of their yellow eyes. She walked from the driver's side, around the front end of the car, toward the passenger side door. Bao's safety belt had gotten a little stuck and he was having trouble getting himself out of the harness. Annoyed, May reached the passenger side door and opened it for Bao, scolding him to hurry up as she did so. It was this sudden burst of noise from May that triggered one of the felines into action. Before now, he was too confused to decide how to react. But the sudden sound that came from the woman wiped all traces of thought from his mind. It turned into every ounce of the wild hunter that it was born to be. Racing out of the trees toward the woman's back, Bao saw the tiger first. He uttered a scream, and May turned to what he was looking at behind her, just in time to see the striped black and orange cat speeding toward her. It was so quick that May didn't have any time to react before the beast sank its teeth into her thigh. She did not immediately feel any pain, but she could feel the pressure of its jaws clamping down on her leg and hear the sickening sound of her flesh ripping to shreds between those razor-sharp teeth as it dragged her off her feet. The hunter didn't try to finish May off there. It was smart enough to start dragging her off to the safety of the trees. When it started pulling her, May finally felt the agonizing pain of her muscle being torn from the bone. Screaming and flailing, her struggles made no impact on the swiftly moving beast that had her in its grip. But Bao, suddenly free from his seatbelt, bound out of the car to the defense of his wife, An 
from the back seat reacted in the same way. When she saw the tiger coming from the trees, she was no longer an old woman. Adrenaline and love drove her from the car, turning her into a woman 30 years younger. She ran after her son-in-law and her screaming daughter. Neither Bao nor An had any idea what they would do when they reached the predator. They only knew that they would fight with every ounce of their being to get Mei out of there. The tiger that had Mei in his jaws must have realized this, because he took one look at the pair running toward him and the armored car already speeding toward the tree line, and it knew that it was outnumbered. It unclenched its jaws, leaving Mei bleeding on the ground, and took off toward the depths of the trees. But the danger was far from over. A second tiger, a female, was hidden behind some bushes, but she had taken a little more time to assess the situation. She had mere seconds to react if she was going to get a kill away from this site before the men in the military vehicle made it the last few meters to the group. Once they arrived, the tiger's chances of a successful hunt went down to zero. The tiger leapt out of the bushes and landed right on top of the smallest and weakest member of the group, and that was the elderly Mon. Ba was already kneeling beside Mei, trying to hoist her over his shoulder, but he was having trouble lifting her, so he carried her in both arms instead. He was going to run as fast as he could to get her back to the car, and with Mei already screaming in his ears, he didn't hear or see the attack on his mother-in-law behind him. An was driven into the ground by the 300-pound animal. The tiger went straight for the jugular, sinking its teeth into An's neck, shoulder, and face. An did not even get the opportunity to yell out. The force that clamped onto her completely crushed her airways and neck and rendered her ability to push air past her vocal cords obsolete. The female tiger saw that the personnel carrier had come to a stop and half a dozen men carrying firearms rushed out. She heaved the struggling woman toward the trees, but her teeth tore right through An's neck, essentially yanking the older woman free. Bao turned carrying Mei in his arms, ready to sprint to their family car, but he stopped short. There were at least six men holding weapons running towards them. His mother-in-law lay on the ground. The severed artery in her neck was spouting blood out of her like a fountain, and the orangey blur that was the female tiger shot back into the trees like lightning. The men took Mei from Bao's arms and loaded on onto a stretcher. An was no longer moving, and even Bao knew that there was nothing anyone could do. She just bled out so fast that she was dead before they even got her into the back of the personnel car beside her injured daughter. Bao followed them in his own car, his daughter still strapped into her car seat, where she had slept through the entire ordeal. Fast forward eight months later, and Mei had endured several surgeries. A funeral was held for An. Bao and Mei still had nightmares, and baby Jia had grown like a weed. But the horrific events of that day, so many months ago, were far from over, because the Zhao family filed a lawsuit against the Beijing Zoo. That first year of recovery and the lawsuit now upon them, the Zhao family were drawn into an incredibly drawn-out lawsuit. It's been almost seven years, and it's still not completely come to an end. The courts did eventually decide that the zoo had sufficient warning signs set up, and that their armed personnel's quick response was the reason that the entire family did not die on that horrible day. But the Beijing Zoo still had a lot to answer for. In the three years that preceded the death of An and the permanent disability that Mei now has to live with, there were two other deadly attacks at the zoo. Both were staff members, and one of the deaths occurred in the very tiger enclosure where An lost her life. The tiger responsible for An's tragic death at Beijing Zoo Park was not euthanized by the zoo. Instead, it remained in an enhanced enclosure away from the public to prevent any other park visitors from meeting their terrifying final affliction. It was May of 2007, and Indonesia hadn't had a dry season quite this severe in years. The sun was swelteringly hot, and there was almost no moisture in the air. The locals, who are more acclimated to tropical conditions, were wishing for the wet season to arrive, even if that meant flooding and storms. At least, they would finally get some respite from the heat. 
Of all the islands, Komodo Island was suffering the most. The island is much less urbanized than the rest of the country, allowing for more wildlife to thrive there. This is pivotal to the island's ability to protect the famed Komodo dragon that lives there. There are two other Indonesian islands that also have decent-sized populations of these unique lizards, but none more so than Komodo Island itself. Various bird, oceanic, and reptile species call the island home, but it's the deer and wild boars that are the Komodo dragon's main food source. The Indonesian people are very protective of their unusual and extremely dangerous lizard, not only because they are a rare animal found nowhere else in the world, but also because their tourism industry is utterly reliant on the animal's survival. There are other places that have monitor lizards, but the Komodo dragon, though related to the monitors, is unique. It's the only one in the genus that is venomous, and they are the largest of them all. Even if you manage to survive an attack from one of these beasts, the chances of dying from infection and hemorrhage after the event are almost certain. Most of the very few survivors are those who were lucky enough to have the affected limb amputated within minutes of the initial bite, but most attacks end in death. And yet, despite thousands of these vicious creatures crawling all over the island, the inhabitants of Komodo live quite peacefully among the modern-day dragons. Life just goes on, business is taken care of, and children play without a care in the world. In all fairness to the inhabitants of the island, attacks are incredibly rare. Mostly, they are reserved for the very unfortunate souls that happen to walk right on top of one of these creatures. Any animal will attack if it's cornered, after all whether you meant to aggravate it or not. But on this day in May, it wasn't a case of an accidental meeting between a human and a predator. This time, the creature was actively hunting. You see, the dry and hot weather was a lean season for the animals in the Philippines. There wasn't as much food growing for the herbivores, so they died or managed to make it to one of the other islands that were close enough. That meant that the only large predator on the island had less to eat than usual. The Komodo dragons were becoming restless and ravenous. Only extreme conditions would have driven the 10-foot monstrosity to heave its 300-pound body into the village to look for food. Right after most of the adults had left for work, the children were out playing. Even as early as it was, it was already hot. In a few hours, it would be so warm that even kids, who never seemed to mind extreme weather when they could be having fun, would seek shelter in their homes. Rudaharto Safina was one of the few older people around that morning, besides the children, and the very oldest that lived in the community. He liked to keep an eye on the kids, since a lot of them were his own nieces and nephews. That's just the kind of values the Philippines are built on. Everyone looks out for everyone. Rudaharto grew up being watched by his relatives, and he was happy to do the same while he serviced his fishing gear in the shade of his front stoop. One of the youngsters out that day was Little Rudaharto, or Young Rudy, as everyone called him. There were so many Rudahartos in the Safina family that people needed a way to distinguish the boy from his uncle and his grandfather, who also shared the same name. Rudy was one of about a dozen children out playing a game of soccer in the street that day. Rudaharto sat down to watch his eight-year-old nephew play, and he had to smile at how little Rudy disregarded all of the rules. The little boy thought it was incredibly funny to intentionally annoy his friends by picking up the ball and pretending that he was playing American football instead. Not that the children minded, they were laughing just as hard as Rudy was. It was too hot to take the game too seriously anyway, but just a few meters away from the children, hidden by a clutch of bushes, lay the Komodo dragon that had slunk toward the village early that morning. Dozens of people passed by it, oblivious to the danger that hid beneath the dry foliage. It was perfectly camouflaged. The morning was so busy with people heading to work and the early bustle of daily chores that it had not dared to strike just yet. It was ravenously hungry, but it wasn't stupid. There was no way that it was going to storm into a street bustling with people who would surely kill it on sight if it dared show itself. 
No, the reptile was going to have to wait for one unlucky human to get separated from the pack. It had been looking for food for two days now, but there were just no deer or boars to be found. Humans were a dangerous prey to target. The animals knew that full well, but desperate times called for desperate measures. All it needed to do was be patient. Surely one of them would come within reach sooner or later, and unfortunately for little Rudy, that moment came all too soon. After an hour of rambunctious play and plenty of water breaks, Rudy had a very full bladder, so he called out to his friends to stop the game and wait for him to get back. He wasn't going to miss out on the fun if he could help it. Rudy ran as fast as he could to the clump of bushes on the other side of the road to relieve himself. The thing that was lying in wait couldn't have asked for a target to come any closer. The skinny boy was running straight at the bushes where it was hidden. Rudy did not even glance at the ground, or he would have run the other way when he saw the dragon that was coiled there. But his eyes were on the game, making sure that his buddies didn't dare go on without him. Poor Rudy hadn't even had the opportunity to undo his pants when the beast sprang at him. As he screamed, his entire body was lifted above the bushes. The lizard hadn't just bitten into him, it took after Rudy at a run. When it closed its jaws around Rudy's thin frame, both the boy and the animal were lifted several feet into the air, propelled by the pure brute force and speed that it hit Rudy with. For a second that seemed to last an eternity, the boys in the dirt street and Rudaharto stared in horror at the scene that was unfolding before them. Rudy and the dragon sailed through the air, and as they came down from their airborne arch, the creature started shaking its head violently. The moment it tasted blood, it wasn't going to wait until it hit solid ground before it started tearing its prey to shreds. In a shower of blood and limbs, they hit the ground with such a crash that the ground beneath the kids and Rudaharto's feet trembled. That's when Rudaharto sprang into action. The man sprinted toward the bloody scene, picking up the soccer ball as he ran. It was the biggest thing he could get his hands on. He threw it with pinpoint accuracy, but the air light ball merely glanced off the raging lizard's back without the creature even taking notice of it. It was shaking the screaming boy so ferociously that the child's limbs detached from his body as he was flailing so violently. Halfway across the road, he picked up a fist-sized rock and threw that too, and several more rocks flew at the reptile from behind him. Rudaharto's action also brought the young boys out of their stupor, and they threw their own earthen missiles at the animal too. There were dozens of rocks flying through the air, and before the boys threw the second round of rocks, the rest of the few villagers in the vicinity moved in with brooms, empty bottles, and whatever else they could get their hands on. In the shower of blood, pieces of Rudy's flesh, dust, and the thrashing body of the thing that was trying to rip the young boy to pieces, it was impossible to tell what they were hitting. The beast finally felt the strikes, and it released its catch to find the source of the pain. When it looked up, it saw some twenty people moving in on it, mercilessly pelting it with sharp things that broke its skin and left searing wounds. There was no way that it could fight off the horde, so it turned tail and scuttled with a surprising speed toward the deeper bush, taking Rudy's lower half with him. It was gone as quickly as it appeared, leaving a trail of blood in the bone-dry earth behind it. But tiny Rudy was in worse shape. The monster had ripped him completely in two. From the waist down, there were nothing but tatters of muscle and entrails. His legs and hips had disappeared into the wilderness with his attacker. It was a miracle that he was still conscious at all. Rudy was beyond screams and words now. He stared wildly at his neighbors as they descended upon him, his breathing shallow and labored. Rudaharto kneeled beside his nephew. He'd taken off his shirt and was trying to stem the bleeding from the ruined stump that was left of Rudy's body. The men, women, and children started removing their own shirts to help stop the flow. But Rudaharto had barely placed the fourth piece of fabric around Rudy when the boy shuddered and went still. That mischievous smile would never again grace his face, and all that was left was the ghost of the final moments of terror in his blank, staring eyes.
Emergency services came just a few minutes later, though they only came to remove the remains. By that time, the villagers were already in the trees, armed with shovels, picks, and sharpened sticks. They wanted to avenge Rudy and the trauma that his little friends endured, but it was of no use. Among the thousands of Komodo dragons, there was just no way to tell which one attacked Rudy. They looked for one that bore the injuries from the rocks and glass bottles that they threw at it, but to no avail. The beast was gone, and after a week of searching, they had to give up. By that time, most of its wounds would have healed, and it would become entirely impossible to tell it apart from the others. Having tasted human flesh for the first time, it is only a matter of time that it strikes again, bringing another unsuspecting villager like Rudy to their terrifying final affliction.